Hello, everybody. Welcome in Zal 3 now. Um, you're going to listen to the presentation Frozen Cash. Uh, maybe some of you have seen two years ago Joseph Applebaum presenting um, the cold boot attack at this conference. Uh, and today, you're, which made your encrypted laptops more insecure or less secure than you hoped. And today, you might see a remedy, which is presented by our speaker, Jürgen Pabel. And I ask you to welcome him. Well, thank you for being here. Now I have a tough conversation with the hacker Um I think I'll be fairly quick, so if you want to go over and... What's that? Okay. So, I think we'll probably be through in a little bit over half an hour. And if you have questions, we've got plenty of time for that. So, um, you know, I work as a security consultant, and uh, I have a blog from work which um, has lots of different topics that I write about, not fairly frequently, but every now and then. And also, I'm going to start my personal blog you know, whenever there's time. So, um, first I'm going to talk a little bit about what the cold boot attacks are, uh, just to refresh your memory. Then I'm going to talk about uh, what the uh, frozen cache approaches, what, what it does, what it doesn't do. I'm going to give you a demo, which is going to be really impressive, because you're going to see a really slow computer. And um, then there will be little messy details, which I'm going to skip over in the beginning, just to get the point across. And then there's time for questions. So the cold boot attacks, um, discover, they discovered that uh, when you turn off a computer, uh, that your memory doesn't uh, go blank uh, immediately, but rather the data uh, is kept for you know, seconds or even minutes if you cool it down. And uh, in the aftermath of this uh, research, they discovered that there was a paper from IBM which had also discovered the same fact a couple of years ago. But nonetheless, this was the first research. Oh, okay, so... Um, that was the, uh, the research that uh, tied the uh, combination from accessing RAM uh, contents to um, forming an attack that impacts the security of full disk encryption software. Okay, so now I have three mics and... <laughs> <laughs> so that was two years ago um, here, and also two years ago, uh, I watched a presentation by Peter Stooge, uh, who talked about the core boot, which is a, a Linux implementation for a BIOS replacement. And he mentioned something uh, about the initialization of hardware, where they had problems initializing the uh, memory controller, and that this code is very hardware dependent and uh, needs to be adapted for uh, every single controller, and that that was a huge effort to uh, custom create uh, code, assembly code for every single um, make and model out there. So they were looking for something to um, to make it easier on them. And uh, what they then uh, found was this uh, cache as RAM mode, uh, as it's sort of known on uh, AMD, and known as no fill mode on Intel CPUs, which allows you to use the cache just as you would usually but um, in this mode, the cache doesn't go back into memory. So what they were then able to do is uh, implement their programs, their initialization routines using the, uh, the cache, so they had a lot more uh, room to implement their logic uh, to initialize the uh, memory controller and had a lot less uh, worries to, to implement this. So the idea was then uh, to uh, take this mode and apply it to the... Uh, as a solution to the cold boot problem and to essentially not keep the cryptographic data in memory anymore, but to move it on the, on the chip, on the CPU, so that uh, if you extracted the RAM, you don't get the uh, cryptographic keys. 
and extracting the contents from the cache isn't that easy because there's no real interface that you can ask a CPU to, you know, get out the data. And even if you were able to do that, once you lose power to the CPU and you uh, reapply power to it, the uh, initialization of the CPU will uh, clear the uh, cache internally, something that memory uh, RAM doesn't do itself. So, like I said, we're gonna skip over some details. And um, I want you to think about caching as a sort of two-task thing. One is loading data into the cache. You know, usually it will be something where it will be fetched from memory into the cache. And the second part is then getting the uh, memory, the contents from the cache to the RAM. And for the purpose of this talk, it's most easiest, uh, uh, easiest if you think about it th as these as two different uh, tasks that the cache does. And also we're gonna just focus on a single CPU system for now, and um, even more precisely with a system that only has a single CPU, so no hyper-threading or anything. And I'll get into the, uh, the details what that means with uh, multi-CPU systems uh, at the end. So important to know is that uh, CPUs nowadays, they have two levels of cache commonly on the CPU, level one cache and level two cache. Level one cache is uh, extremely fast, usually at uh, uh, clock speed of the, uh, the CPU, and uh, it's divided uh, usually into an instruction cache and a uh, data cache, whereas the level two cache is combined and uh, any data that's in there could be data that's executed as code or data that's interpreted as data, whereas in the level one cache it'll be you know, split up, okay, is this an execution um, instruction or is it data? A little side note, in um, most CPUs, the level one cache, the instructions are uh, already decoded. So if you have the, uh, the assembly, uh, the, the machine code um, instruction, uh, in level one cache, usually it's already ex uh, extracted, so the CPU doesn't have to go through the decoding stuff again. But that's just a little t a tidbit of information on the side. So on x86, and uh, this is mostly for 32 and 64-bit modes uh, the same, you have uh, a control register, CR0, which um, has a couple of bits that uh, indicate the uh, cache operating mode. Uh, the one flag is uh, CD cache disable. When you, dis uh, when you activate this bit, it's essentially the part that prevents data from being loaded into the cache whereas the other bit, uh, not right through, is more or less a bit that um, manages how data uh, will then be pushed out of the cache back into RAM. That's not entirely correct, but let's leave it at that for now. Um, there's also uh, other mechanisms on the uh, platform that uh, can manage how um, caching is, uh, behaves on the system, and the first one are the um, memory type range registers, and they are used to set up uh, specific uh, memory regions for things like uh, graphic card memory so that uh, any changes to uh, memory regions that are then represented uh, through the graphic card, that those don't get cached so you get the immediate uh, update on the display. And then there's the uh, page attribute table which allows uh, for individual pages to be marked as cacheable or non-cacheable. An interesting differentiation is that uh, MTR um, acts on physical address ranges, so this is really the address that essentially gets sent down to the uh, memory controller to indicate the specific cell that uh, holds that data. Whereas the uh, PAT operates on the linear address ranges, uh, which is practical for operating systems to indicate certain um, ranges that um, the operating system deems uh, cache worthy. And then there's different types of memory uh, with respect to cacheability, um, and these range from entirely uncacheable, meaning any uh, changes to it will immediately get propagated down to memory to uh, something like fully cacheable in terms of it can be held as long as possible in the cache and whenever there's a need to push it out into RAM, it'll be done. So, 
when you want to activate the uh, no fill mode, all you have to do essentially is uh, flip two bits, the uh, cache disable and the uh, not write through bit. And um, we have the, the uh, assembly instructions up here. Um, from what I said in the beginning, um, activating the cache disable bit prevents the uh, data from uh, being pulled into the cache, whereas the not write through bit prevents it from being pushed out to the memory again. Turns out this uh, not write through bit is not really supported anymore. So essentially it comes down to a single bit, the cache disable bit, and the uh, various combinations that you can have with two bits, uh, they are documented in the Intel uh, software development manual. And um, like I said, the uh, setting of both bits is no longer supported. I think it was Pentium 3 or 4 when, when that was discontinued. So um, when you actually turn on a CPU nowadays, when it powers up, the uh, no fill mode is what the CPU will operate in un until the, uh, the mode of operation is changed by the uh, software. And there are lots of different minor aspects that vary across uh, CPU models. So the, the basic behavior in terms of how data remains in, in the cache or gets evicted, written back to memory, are more or less the same, but uh, side effects uh, could be something like when I have this no fill mode activated and want to know about caching statistics, how much data has the cache held, how much uh, hits have been uh, done to the cache, or uh, how many misses uh, have occurred. Uh, that varies a lot depending on what specific CPU you have. So just starting from that, um, We'll get to it a little bit later, but that turns out to be a little difficult to handle in a generic way to assure that the uh, initial goal, keeping data in the cache, is actually accomplished or not. So it makes it harder to verify. So when you have the, uh, the frozen cache mode, what you want to do is you want to switch from normal operation in terms of your system is up and running into frozen cache mode where all your sensitive data is pulled into the cache and uh, removed from memory. So what you do is you take that data, uh, load it into a CPU register, then override the uh, data in memory, make sure that that write actually gets sent down to the memory so that data is uh, no longer present in memory. And then you freeze the CPU and then write the uh, data into the uh, CPU cache so that they now exist there and for as long as the CPU cache doesn't decide to then flush this data back out into memory then you don't have the uh, actual values in memory. So what's important of course to this mode is that you you really can rely on the uh, these attributes. You don't want to activate this mode and then turns out hey my data does end up in memory anyhow. So the first part is I need to uh, configure the uh, initialization so that the data is uh, altogether in cache and then you have to make sure that it doesn't, you know, incidentally get written back into memory later on. So what data do we need to protect? When we uh, look at full disk encryption, obviously the encryption key. And everybody knows about the uh, AES keys, 128 bits or um, figures, and um, what's commonly used is the uh, FIPS 197 uh, setup procedure, so to say, which derives a specific encryption and a specific decryption key from the 128-bit uh, that you have um, initially. And then there's also the key schedule, which are derived keys that are used in the encryption and decryption ca uh, calculations. And of course, you have uh, intermediary data that uh, occurs when you when you actually calculate the uh, encryption or decryption, and uh, of course that needs to be protected as well, because else someone could use that data to run uh, cryptographic uh, attacks on um, these bits that they found there. Find there. So when you initialize it, 
when you activate the uh, frozen cache mode, you have to consider cache pollution because when you run the code that initializes it, this is code that can be, or that will be present in the cache, that will be present in the level one cache, in the instruction cache, but definitely in the uh, level two cache. So um, this code itself needs to be considered when activating frozen cache mode and also the um, pointers to the cryptographic data itself need to be considered. So you have the data you want to protect, the data that points to the data that you want to protect and the code that actually does protect the data. And if you have questions, just raise your hand um, anytime. We have a question right there. I'm not sure about the uh, PC architecture, but I know from embedded power PC processors that there are special um, um, commands for the memory management unit and for the uh, cache controller that you can say, uh, I, for example, reduce the cache size and, and I grab a slice of the cache of maybe 128 uh, um, kilobytes or something, depending on the architecture, that I reserve to be a special RAM memory. And this is also it, it is possible to address this memory like normal memory, and so you don't have to do this this fancy stuff. So if you if you, for example, have some function pointers just to put some some values inside, and then you have have to uh, fight against interrupts that could destroy your cache because some some evil stuff uh, goes through the cache because there was a DMA pro, pro, uh, stuff, and you have a poisoned cache, and then you have have some some text that the cache is invalidated, and some routines is uh, go. Uh, uh, destroying your, your keys and stuff like that because it would be very evil to have this as a, in a normal cache. You would have, you would want to disable this section of uh, cache and you don't want to have this controlled by the cache controller. How do you do how do you do this? Okay, so first off, the um, x86 architecture doesn't allow you to do that. It, it's really um, very basic in terms of what it provides with caching, how you control the cache. Um, essentially, the no-fill mode uh, guarantees that any data that's in the cache right there will remain in the cache in terms of it won't be evicted and replaced with other data. What it doesn't guarantee is that the data that's in the cache won't, for various reasons, be then written back out into memory. So. Um, yes, it would be nice to have more um, control on how the cache behaves, but it just isn't implemented on x86. So um, that's one of the, the aspects is, okay, I, with this no-fill mode, you, you know that the data is there. What you don't know is, has it been written back into memory yet? And um, that's something I'll get to at the end uh, in determining, okay, has it been written back or not? So, does that answer your question, sort of? I, I know it wasn't really a question, but was that the information you wanted? I, I'll repeat. So roughly, um, but but it's, it proves that the x86 is a evil architecture that is full of flaws, and it's it's not worth to to do serious stuff with it, uh, because if you cannot if you cannot disable a cache controller, and if you cannot say I want to use half of the cache controller, this is a rotten architecture. Yeah, but it's hard to find good laptops that have a docking port that have reasonable power that have all the the nice interfaces that you want and are, you know, not custom engineered so there, there, that you can afford some, some them. There are some other processors like Spark that are also fine. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> so, the, so, so the point is, is if, you, if you have a rotten cache controller that you cannot, or can you disable the cache controller at all? Or, or it would be fine to put the AES core also inside the cache, so the AES with, with the keys is, is uh, doing its stuff and is looking there and is sitting there and have some, has some fun because it's executed quite fast and the keys are in, are in a safe harbor, and so, so it would be perfect to do it like this. It would, just not on x86. <laughs> <laughs> So this rotten. <laughs> okay, so 
one of the aspects, uh, like I said, is you have to protect various data and you have to consider the initialization function and make sure that everything will actually fit in your cache. So um, one component of the, um, the frozen cache is uh, a level two cache emulator, which uh, verifies that the data you want to put into the cache will actually fit into the cache uh, when considering various constraints that caches have. Just because you have a cache that's two megabyte doesn't mean that you could really effectively put two megabyte of data in it because of uh, associativity and other issues that might reduce the effective size that you can put into it. So therefore there's an emulator that verifies that you know you want to add some data to it and it checks, okay, will this work or will this not work? And of course the uh, level two cache emulator itself is also part of the data that needs to be put into the ca uh, cache itself. So all this is uh, in implemented in the uh, enable uh, car function, which uh, caches RAM is what that is supposed to mean. And um, obviously this function, uh, you need to know what you program, uh, how that ends up uh, as a compiled binary. So um, first off, it's, uh, it uses sp uh, specific um, directives in C, like the uh, register directive, so that your uh, variables that you have uh, are kept as a register and not you know, used in RAM itself, which could then impact your calculation for the, uh, for the cache usage. And of course, it's used uh, compiled with, um, without optimization, so what you tell it to do is hopefully what it will compile. Um, interrupts will be disabled in this uh, initialization routine, so you uh, don't have any other things that will go on, uh, will go on that would interrupt. They Repeat, please. Later, messy stuff. <laughs> So um, everything is inline, so there are no calls, um, so that you know, okay, I have a chunk of uh, code that will execute, and this is all in one block that I could then um, consider for the uh, the calculation of the uh, the cache layout. And there's you know no stack or heap access um, because that would also impact the um, the data in the in the cache. And of course, the only exception for that is the target set that what you want to be in the cache. And then there's a, um, a performance check that measures how, how long it takes to access the data. And um, if you measure a difference before the setup and after the setup, then you have um, a fairly good assurance that your data is now in cache because uh, when you have to ex pull it from RAM, it'll take a lot longer. So the problem, like I said, is um, it's slow, really slow, and I'll show you how slow it is. So when what you need, one of the um, things that still needs a lot of work is using the so far unused space in the cache to add performance relevant code into the cache so that it uh, it helps improve the performance. And um, an example for that could be uh, the uh, interrupt service routines so that you don't have um, slow timer interrupts, for example. Um, obviously, it's a, a good thing only to activate this when it's really necessary and necessary from a security standpoint. If you have your laptop and your screen isn't locked, then who cares about the uh, cold boot attacks? I have access to your data anyhow. And standby could be another part where it could be interesting, but I haven't looked into that too much, so I don't know if really standby is something where this could work or not. Questions? Okay. So I'm demoing this on my presentation laptop. I'm fairly sure it works, but we'll see. Um, so. Activation, I'll do it one-handed. So activation of uh, frozen cache mode is uh, controlled using a proc file entry. And the uh, proc file entry is proc frozen cache. And the uh, primary purpose for using the proc file system instead of the uh, system because it was easier to implement. So. What 
I'm going to do first is I'm going to deactivate it. And I mean, it's deactivated right now, but I deactivate it because I can then, after I activate it, disable it again using just two times the up key and the enter key. So there. OK. So what's really interesting, OK, so I hit the up button. That was fairly quick. Hit it again. OK. <laughs> there you go. What's interesting is that the uh, graphical subsystem or the, uh, the, hard, the graphics accelerations aren't impacted that much because the, uh, the graphic card does that. So if I were to minimize the window and then um, uh, switch back to it, all the nice GUI stuff works perfectly. But anything the, uh, the CPU does, like switching the task, et cetera, it takes forever, so I'm not going to do that. But, you know, the, the little, whatever, disappearing effects, they work nice. So I've already hit enter on the uh, deactivation again. And um, this is without much optimization. So right now it's only the, uh, the target set of selves that's in the cache. So the goal would be here to get the target set um, to extend it to include the screen lock, for example, so that you can type in your password and not have to wait forever for uh, for it to um, for it to to process your inputs. So I've got some frozen cache. I've got some debug messages that are outputted. And um, the first couple things, they are actually, they happen at boot time because the uh, kernel module, frozen cache as a kernel module, is loaded uh, as part of the init RAM FS initialization. And uh, right here we have the first chunk, which is 1,024 byte. That's actually the initialization function, so the enable cache as RAM function. The next part, 256 byte, is the array of pointers to the target data, plus an array that holds the length of data to be protected. And then the next four lines, there are actually 32 bytes each. Those are actual cryptographic um, keys that are used. There are four because there's a copy in the mcrypt that needs to be protected. Then there's a copy inside the... Um, inside the uh, inside the uh, uh, cryptographic implementation, in this case AES. And I think I have four because I have another partition that's mounted, but I'm not really sure right now. No, wait. Those are actually just two because there's add, add to cache as RAM, which is 32 byte, and then the add to dcache, which is the uh, emulator. So this is actually just uh, the, uh, the key ones in dmcrypt and ones in the uh, AES cryptographic uh, part that are shown. So, that worked out. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the messages you saw there, they're not really all that useful right now because it's work in progress and really work in progress. It does work, but it's you know, not completed. We have another question. So I have an idea, but I'm not sure if this works because it's on, it's, it's unclean. Um, what about uh, so so in, in the cache controller there always is a te there are tech texts that say that this memory address is dirty. So because maybe you haven't had a DMA. So the thing is, what about setting? Uh, on purpose, some areas in the cache dirty and use the dirty areas in the cache. So the cache controller won't touch them because they are dirty and you can do what you want with them. I, the way I understood your question, it doesn't make sense, so I probably didn't understand it correctly. <laughs> you, you said you want to mark data in the cache as dirty in terms of uh, different from what's in memory? Yeah, yes. Yes, and that's right. Yes. Yeah. That's because the state, actually. That yes. is the state. So in no-fill mode, um, the data is actually different 
in cash than it is in RAM. In RAM, the, uh, the uh, area with the um, cryptographic keys are all zeroed out, whereas the representation in the cache is actually the key data that's in there. The idea was to use the cache as normal, but uh, say uh, on purpose with some evil tricks, that this some area in the cache is always dirty, because you mark them as dirty, and so they are not used by the cache controller. Still not. <laughs> But, but we have to think about it, so that's just an, just an idea, but you have to find in the data sheets if it's possible to do this. Okay, um, why don't we have a talk later on, because I think you know a lot of aspects that I might not have discovered yet. So let's talk afterwards, and um, at the end I'll have a few um, aspects that are in addition to DMA that might uh, impact the effectiveness. So frozen cache is, um, Kernel module, it has actually a copy of dmcrypt. A copy because uh, dmcrypt, there uh, need to be a couple of uh, hooks that actually invoke frozen cache, um, like telling frozen cache, okay, the cryptographic key is actually right in this memory location. And I really don't like the fact that dmcrypt is a copy inside this module, but I didn't find a good way to, um, to sort of grab into another kernel module and uh, and get the data out from there or to add a hook there um, without binary instrumentation and I just didn't want to do that. So it was much easier to copy it, add a few lines and be good. So when you actually move the data into the cache, you do it one cache line at a time. A cache line is essentially um, the single um, entity that the cache operates on and usually it's not a byte but it's commonly nowadays 64 bytes. And um, so when you uh, have a, um, like the 1024 byte area, that gets uh, pulled into the cache 64 byte at a time. So it's the, uh, the bootstrap code, the pointer array, and the cryptographic data, the three pieces. And the, um, the activation of frozen cache mode uh, I have a little Python script that I tested out to make sure it does work, but it's not usable, just like the rest of the system right now. Um, so the idea is to have a DBus listener that detects, okay, screen lock is on, let's go into frozen cache mode. So cryptographic data is scattered in RAM in different places. Like I said, one is managed by the mcrypt. Um, others by the, uh, the actual cryptographic uh, implementation. The uh, intermediate data um, is on the stack usually uh, by the implementations just because it's variables that are used in the, uh, in the calculation. So um, like I said, the, uh, the mcrypt has added uh, calls to hooks which then um, add this data to the cache and that's easy because it's just a call, whereas the uh, intermediate data that's in the in the calculation routines um, that if that's on the stack you need to m figure out okay so which memory page is this stack frame on at that time and then load that into a memory also and that's also work that still needs to be done um, and that really will require additional calls uh, to the uh, the implementation of the encryption routines so same question where are my bits different aspects. Um, with respect to are they in the cache, are they uh, in memory, or are they both? I mean, are they not in the cache anymore? And because the uh, x86 caching uh, system is so so trivial, so simple, I mean, you, you can control what you want to cache, but you can't determine um, what's in the cache uh, and all that. Um, there's the uh, risk that any instruction that operates in the uh, system that has uh, uh, required privileges that can uh, initiate an explicit uh, cache flushing, indica uh, indicating to the CPU that the, the cache content should be written back to memory. Obviously, that's a problem, and um, one way to um, determine this is to access the CPU cache statistics, and that's a, a special register that the CPUs provide where you can get the information, okay, how many cache flushes have occurred since the last time uh, these counters have been reset or just 
take a different, uh, the difference from the last time you measured these. Other ideas to make sure that your data doesn't get written back into memory could be to use um, non-existent uh, physical addresses. So you write uh, your data to a different memory location that if the cache tries to then push it back into memory, uh, it would result in a, uh, um, a, a CPU exception. And that's something that I've played with a little bit, but I just couldn't get my specific CPU to, to work with that. I'm fairly certain that different CPU uh, models will behave different, so there might be models that can be um, tricked into that, so you have a, uh, the assurance that your data never gets back out into uh, RAM. Another idea would be to use device-backed physical addresses, so maybe your data doesn't end in your, um, in your RAM stick, but rather maybe in a dedicated um, graphic card or any other mem uh, uh, device backed addresses. Whether that's feasible in terms of not impacting the behavior of that device or anything is something that I haven't looked into. So, messy details. I already mentioned uh, cache associativity. Um, with the, um, the caches, the, they um, have a certain mapping, so you can't fill out uh, just uh, two megabytes of data to, into the cache for any reason, but you have to consider um, how is the mapping that the specific uh, cache has so that you uh, don't overwrite um, an entry that the uh, cache would then say, okay, I would have to push it out or I just don't have a free slot for it. Cache hier hierarchy is an issue. Um, usually you have a first and second level cache, now it's, uh, some, uh, the, uh, the modern server CPUs, they have a third level cache. Other uh, motherboards, for example, have a, a third level cache that they provide uh, on the board. And um, hyperthread and multi-core systems, they are sort of good because you could then put one CPU into this mode and get still full performance from the others as long as they don't touch that address uh, that you're keeping in the cache of one CPU. Um, if another CPU were to touch that data, they would issue a snoop instruction to the, uh, the CPU asking, okay, so who has this data? Is there anyone who has it? And is that data maybe even modified to, from what's in memory? So one important aspect would be then to bind the uh, kcrypt uh, D kernel thread onto that CPU that's actually in frozen cache mode. Uh, to make sure that only this thread accesses this, this data and if it's bound to the CPU that's in this mode, there shouldn't be any problem. Back to your um, notes from the beginning, system management is something that I haven't really thought about in terms of what that might do to CPU caches. I mean, it's, it's not anything that you would expect for um, your regular laptop to, to impact you when you're working, but it's something that needs to be looked at and uh, determined how can this be handled or is that something that, you know, if system management mode is detected, um, then uh, maybe a pop-up box or just any kind of warning indicating that the, uh, the correctness isn't uh, there anymore. And also CPUs that uh, provide CPU virtualization like the uh, um, VT, uh, they also have impacts on the cache, so that's also an area for more research. And something really nasty is uh, speculative prefetching. That's um, a CPU internal mechanism. Was there a question? Oh, okay. Um, and um, that's something that you really don't have any control over. So, other than looking at the uh, statistics, there's no way to determine whether prefetching actually has impacted the operations. So there's a lot more work to do, and um, I'm going to get to it, but it'll take a while. So this has been the talk on the current state, which is sort of the proof of concept, but not the, uh, the complete solution. So I think I'll release the source code once it's 
sort of completed, not in terms of a perfect solution, but once it's so that others will be able to extend on it, understand it, look at it, um, my goal would be for this to be within the next three months. So now, questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, although, I know you have more questions. Are there any other questions? Maybe that... Okay, now you have the mic, so go ahead. Okay, so I just had another idea. Um, um, normally computers have graphics processors, and graphics processors could also have caches. And these graphics processors are having normally a very uh, dull life, making a 2D desktop and sitting around and waiting for some work to do. And so I think it would be possible to take the cache of these graphic processors because they also have the tendency to get hot and so they fight against being cooled down with some uh, uh, cooling agents. That's, what, uh, um, that's one example of the uh, device-backed memory uh, address ranges. Um, with most laptops, which that would be the perfect deployment scenario for this, um, you usually have integrated uh, graphic chipsets that you don't get any benefit because they use the, uh, the memory for their backing. So um, if you have a dedicated memory card, yes, that would be a reasonable example. And it's something where I think uh, it could be done without impacting the operations of that device. So, other questions? Does it work? Yes. Okay, there are two questions from the peace missions. Um, the first is, um, do you have any idea for how to verify that the keys are no longer present in RAM? The, so the answer to that would be the cache statistics that are provided by the CPU itself. So uh, you query it, how many uh, cache line flushes did you have? And if the uh, value that comes up is the same as before, then uh, for all you can tell with the CPU, uh, you can you have to rely on that. Um, the perfect or so the the real answer to that would be okay. Activate the mode, extract it, do a cold boot analysis, and then see if you can find the pieces of data that you are looking for. But um, how many times do you have to do this to really be sure that you have um, had? maybe that one situation where data can be pushed back out into RAM, uh, even though it isn't documented. Uh, so it's something that would have to be an automated uh, test, and I don't think that's really that feasible. So as, no, based, based on the documentation, you could be sure, but yes, there's, there's a, a gray area. The second question? Yeah, the second one is, um, do you really think that the CPU is such a much harder target than RAM, given that in both cases physical access is necessary? Given the CPU is what? Um, the CPU is such a much harder target than the RAM. Yeah, so it's, it's um, based on their documentation. <laughs> There's no way to extract the cache contents from the CPU, um, except maybe uh, indicating a snoop on the on the pin for the CPU, um, asking whether any data in the cache is uh, relevant to uh, uh, JTAG on Intel CPUs. Uh, um. I said that could be possible with JTAG because there are some fine uh, debuggers from American Arium and other companies that could that will reveal you also the, the cache contents because otherwise you will not know that the evil DMR transfer destroyed your cache contents and stuff like that. Okay, so the um, I think if I understood this correctly, the um, the idea there would be to use the, uh, the trace cache from the CPU to detect whether any um, flush caching has occurred. Is that what the... Yes, uh, yes but, but for example, if I would be an evil person to, to grab your computer, I could try to freeze it and t take JTAG to uh, get the cache content. 
because I just have to write some small assembler program uh, that has uh, that I'll put in via JTAG somewhere to be executed, and then I read your cache and put this data to the JTAG tra uh, I/O transfer cells, and I get the data. I think that's correct, although I'm not aware how many systems provide a JTAG interface in terms of laptops. A big, a big computer, every CPU that has some, uh, some means to be a, a good CPU has a JTAG. And so We're talking about x86. <laughs> yes, but it, I know, and I, I, in former times I developed boards, and I know that the Pentium 3, for example, has JTAG. And the better CPUs will definitely have JTAG. Okay, so yeah, I think that could be an attack vector. If, if you have a JTAG interface that you can um, connect to that um, provides you the, uh, the access to uh, inject code into the system, yes, I mean, of course, um, then game over, definitely. Hello? Okay. Okay. Um, to get this uh, crypto problem under control, um, did you know some hardware um, that um, can solve this, uh, this, um, uh, this error or how you will know it um, with, the, uh, with the crypto keys that uh, lies in the memory uh, uh, out of the CPU RAM, uh, some special... Right. Uh, Any other ideas? So is that your question? Um, I think, just off the top of my head right now, I think there could be a, a could be plausible to use the uh, if you have a network card that has a crypto accelerator, then maybe that's something that you could employ to do the calculation and even uh, offload the keys into the crypto accelerator on the network card. But I don't think that there are any laptops that provide you know a network card that has a crypto accelerator and whether then. <coughs> If you do have a, a, uh, a system that has that, I don't know if you can actually offload the key onto the network card. I, I just don't have any experience with that. So Yeah, but um, if there are other ways to sort of complete the, uh, the cryptographic computation by any other device that provides a much more um, much more um, complex sort of access logic to the memory, uh, to its own memory, like a network card. You you pull it out, you initialize it. I would assume that any data in there is erased, although you know maybe that's not the case. Um, but the uh, the essential problem there is that memory itself. You take it out, you put it in somewhere. It doesn't have any self initialization, so to say. And if you have a memory capable device that has self-initialization capabilities and uh, prevents you from accessing the memory directly? No? I'll repeat, if, if you talk loud enough, then I'll repeat it. Very, very good, um, very good note. So the um, the uh, note was that um, even you have such a device, it really wouldn't protect you because if you manage to reset the CPU and, um, for example, uh, start your own operating su system on it, then um, you could then give the instructions to uh, tell whatever component you have to just do the calculations for you or to maybe give you back the keys. So, yes, it would have to be a combination of not being able to um, extract the keys from the device back. So, um, so yeah, probably the, uh, the network card with the, uh, the, the acceleration probably would not be that, wouldn't, it would probably be better, but would, if that's really the perfect solution is, I don't know, yeah. But that's really good, I, yeah. Okay, then another question from the Peace Missions here. So what's the point of keeping just the key data out of RAM 
when RAM is likely to contain a decrypted working copy of a part or parts of the data anyway. Correct. So the, the first answer to this is it would be hard to move all your data that you have in memory into the cache. I mean, you have a, a PDF open or your email, um, that just blows your, your, the size of your cache. Um, of course, you could just purge all that data, um, maybe into encrypted swap, and then um, reduce that attack surface. Um, but on the other side, it's only the data in RAM that's in uh, RAM at that time. If you have one email open, yes, they could read that one email, they could read 10 emails, but they won't be able to access your um, archived folders from uh, the last 10 years unless they are present in RAM, uh, as long as they don't have access to the keys, so they wouldn't be able to decrypt the data on the disk. I think there's another question over there. Right, uh, so this is related. Uh, suppose I would want to provide an operating system service that lets applications specify uh, that some data contains cryptographic keys and should be stored in the cache in some specified situation. Uh, can this be done, in, in other words, when you don't have control over the addresses and layout of the data? And if so, how much memory can I reasonably store in, a, in the cache? as a proportion of the cache size, perhaps. So the, the question is, uh, given the associativity of the cache, how much data can you actually put into the cache, like in real-world situations? I'd have to guess. My guess would be maybe 5%, 10%. So 100 to 200 kilobytes with a 2 megabyte uh, level 2 cache. Uh, that could be way off. I don't know. It, it could be 1%, it could be 50. Uh, it's my semi-educated guess. <laughs> but you have an inherent problem and you cannot l l solve it because you have, the, you have to store the keys in something that, is, that behaves like a RAM. And you have to be able to read the keys. And uh, if the CPU is able to read the keys, then uh, any other uh, setup where you put the CPU or the system to can also read the keys. So the only thing that you can do is having some special hardware device that, that detects that some evil man is coming and then tries to wipe the data. Or you have a one-time pad that is hidden and you X all your RAM with this one-time pad that you have hidden somewhere and you wipe this one-time pad or change this one-time pad, for example. Having a linear shift register that that moves this runtime pad somehow so that it has a another value, but you have to make a special custom hardware to do this. That would be my view, also yes. <laughs> Although I wouldn't have thought of that ten minutes ago. <laughs> uh, if there aren't any urgent questions from the audience, I would take one more question from the internet, and afterwards close because and we have to. I'll be here. So time. anyone who has questions. Come talk to me, and I'd like to talk to you. So that'll be interesting. Any other questions in the audience? Okay, thanks. So, um, so much. Yeah, I know. But so much for me being uh, through in 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, the last question is now from Peace Missions. Um, had, uh, the question was: Has he looked anything into Intel Core i5 with IS ac acceleration? So, have you looked? <laughs> um, I've read about it. Um, I've not read that much about it to uh, determine whether the um, the new uh, cryptographic acceleration components that are in the CPU um, allow you to actually move the key into the CPU or whether the acceleration component will only act on uh, data that's in RAM or in the cache. Um, I don't know. My guess would be that it doesn't provide that capability and it would rather just act on memory because that sort of fits along the um, paradigm that uh, the x86 platform does with the, um, with the SSE and the other, all the other multimedia extensions. They provide more complex operations but um, no additional capabilities besides computational, um, uh, besides computations. So my guess would be no but that's no more than a guess. So thank you, and um, go over there or have fun tonight. <laughs>